Hi there, my name is Justin Laymiller. I am author of the blog Sex and Psychology and the book Tell Me What You Want. And I am joined today by Skype uh, by Joan Price, who um, calls herself an advocate for ageless sexuality. And she is here to talk to us a bit about the issue of sex and aging, which is an issue that I've wanted to cover on the blog a lot more for a long time. Um, but as you know, it's a research-based blog and there isn't a whole lot of research out there about sex and aging. Um, so I thought it'd be great to invite Joan to come on and talk to us a bit about this because she's got uh, extensive expertise in this area. Uh, Joan is the author of an award-winning book called Naked at Our Age, uh, and her most recent book is called The Ultimate Guide to Sex After 50, and she's been running a blog about sex and aging for the last 13 years called Naked at Our Age, uh, which you can visit at nakedatourage.com. And so she is just a wealth of knowledge and information on this subject. So hi, Joan. Thanks for being here. Hi. Thanks so much, Justin. <laughs> Yeah. And I got to say, you said there isn't much research about sex and aging. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, the problem. So, so why, so why is that? Why isn't there more research on sex and aging? Well, I think a few reasons. Um, a lot of the research, and you know more than I do about this, is, is funded by people who have nothing to gain by uh, sex and aging um, information. Uh, I'd love for that to change, but I think the main thing is our society has what I call the ick factor. Ew, really people having sex, I oh, don't want to know about it. And so no one does want to know. I think it's really important because we're either old or we're seniors in training, plan to get old because who wants to die young and that's the only alternative. <laughs> so wouldn't it be a good idea if we knew more other than just the kinds of anecdotal uh, information that I collect, I collect mm -hmm. stories, not statistics, but I would love to have statistics. I have people saying, is it normal to dot, dot, dot? Or what should I do? Uh, how do other people dot, dot, dot? Mm -hmm. Well, I, don't, I, I only know the stories, and it would be really great if there was some research about it. Right. And, and so there certainly is some research, but as you're probably well aware, most of that research tends to take this uh, sort of deficiency view of, of sex and aging, basically meaning wow. that as you get older, your sex life necessarily gets worse or it disappears altogether or you just develop a lot of sexual dysfunction. So there, there really isn't much research at all looking at how sex can still be a positive experience um, as you age. Well, that's right. And there also isn't much, much research about how sex expands as we age, mm -hmm. how sex changes, because it's easy to ask a question, are you having sex? It's not easy to say, how are you having sex? You know, it's not easy to tabulate that kind of answer. But that's what we need to know. I mean, there, there, there are surveys where seniors are asked, are you having sex? But not how has sex changed for you, mm -hmm. or what? How do you get sexual pleasure now? Mm -hmm. Because if someone is asked, "Are you having sex?" Well, they'll usually interpret that to mean, "Are you having penis and vagina intercourse?" If they're straight, and that may not be the important part of the kind of sex they're having. So they may answer yes, or they may answer no. But we don't learn anything from that. If we were asked, if let's see, we were asked, <laughs> um, how do you get sexual pleasure? Oh, you mean we can include, include masturbation, we can include sex toys, we can include oral, we can include my partner's hands, which please me so much, even though we don't have intercourse anymore. You know, then we'll get some real information. Right. And it doesn't have to be doom and gloom, it can be really positive. Right. And, and you actually bring up a really important issue that, that plagues a lot of sexuality research, which is that we don't always define sex for our participants right. when we ask yeah. them if, they've, if they're sexually active. You know, different people might define that in different ways, and there might also be exactly. generational differences in how yes. people do that. So it actually makes it hard to compare something like sexual frequency for people who are younger versus older if they're thinking about and interpreting that question differently. Well, um, exactly. And if they asked us, how do you express yourself sexually? Wouldn't we learn a lot about that? Whoa, that's what I want people to ask us. Right. So, so tell me a little bit, how do you think 
it would benefit all of us if we had more research on sexuality and aging. Golly. Ah, whoa, all of us. We, it would benefit all of us. Yes is the easy answer to your question. <laughs> but yes, how would it? Well, first of all, people who are aging would understand a lot more about how they remain sexual beings lifelong how they can enhance their sexuality lifelong, how they're not freaks if what they want is not what they were taught they should want. Your book is all about that, your marvelous book. Uh, also, people who are younger would, I hope, start to accept older people as sexual beings. Wouldn't just say, oh wait, um, how could anybody want you? And you, you can't imagine that we do hear that. How could anybody want you mm -hmm. where you look? Well, no, it isn't about the way we look. It is about how our bodies can give us sexual pleasure, how our partners, how our own hands, how sex toys can give us sexual pleasure. Lifelong, we need to know how to do that. And as young people, or as I call them, seniors in training, you need to understand what you can do now that will open up sexuality instead of closing it down as you age and some things don't work as well as they used to and some things don't feel as good as they used to and other things maybe uh, intrigue us that didn't used to. If you knew all this all along, wouldn't it make aging uh, feel better and not be so fearful for you? Right. Yeah, so I, I think you make a lot of excellent points um, about, you know, sort of why there isn't research in this area and why it's so important. So my, my last question is really, is there anything you think we can do to help promote more research in this area so that um, so that it's out there and available for people to, to learn about and access? I'm all for talking out loud about older, older age sexuality, sexuality in general, but not closing that down because we've reached some artificially imposed birthday. Um, I think, I, I hate to pass the buck, but I'm going to do that. I think it's up to people like you, Justin, who are in the research world to say, let's figure out how to do this it, it, research or let's figure out how to be more inclusive when we do the research we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and to word it in such a way that it gives us more information, to make sure that seniors know they are invited to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, let's have more communication with, between people like you and people like me, which I hope we're starting to do right now. Right, me too. Um, you know, and something related to what you were saying is um, that it's helping to increase participation rates of uh, older adults in sex research is the advent of online research. Yes. Um, yes. Because prior to that, almost all sex research was done on college students who are just one exactly. small segment <laughs> of the population. Uh, so it, it it's always. Um, fascinating and, and gratifying to me when I get these very large and very diverse samples when I do online research. And, you know, for example, when I do studies of casual sex, I routinely have people in their 60s and 70s um, who participate in these studies. And so that's great uh, that, that we can start to learn a little bit more about sex and aging. Oh, that's so important. And to normalize all these behaviors that, yeah, we're doing. Right. And we need to understand that, yes, this is all normal. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Let's get rid of the shame. Let's get rid of the blame. And let's get rid of the in invisibility. Right. Absolutely. And just one other thing I'll say about my own work is that I've done a lot of research on uh, friends with benefits relationships. And a lot of people think that those are relationships that only college students and you know young adults have. But oh, in, no. no. In, in my studies, I find uh. you've got lots of older adults who have these friends with benefits relationships yeah. too. So you know, casual sex, friends with benefits, all these things, they're not limited to young adults. They don't disappear as, as people age or you know shut off at some artificial uh, or arbitrary point in time, which is important well, that, for people to know. That's so important, Justin. It's so important because um, as we age, we lose people. We may have thought that we believed in one partner forever or one partner exclusively, and we lose a partner. We lose a partner through death, through divorce, through being dumped, through realizing there's got to be more than lot to life than this. And we want to we want to expand our notion of what we thought was okay to do and then we realize this is not only okay this is really hot <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to be
be included in that research is important. It's really important to us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me to talk about sex and aging, Joan. And for those of you who are watching and you want to learn more about this topic, uh, you can check out uh, Joan's books uh, and you can also visit her blog at nakedatourage.com. So thanks again so much for being here, Joan. Thanks for asking, Justin.